Hey guys, welcome to the Anthurium video. Whenever I'm taking video requests, Anthurium videos are pretty much always at the very top. Probably because I push Anthurium so heavily on this channel because just Anthuriums are my favorite genus. I love Anthuriums and Anthuriums just, they just speak to me. I, I went through a little phase when I dabbled a little bit heavier in philodendron, but it always comes back to anthuriums. They just, they embody so many characteristics that I just love in plants. They mesh well with my care style. So what I mean by that is um, I do not like plants that grow out of control very quickly. They, they, it just stresses me out. When it outgrows a pot, when it outgrows a space, when it gets leggy, when it when it loses the support. Anthuriums, they just don't do that. And they really size up like leaf to leaf. If they're very happy, they're very satisfying to grow. They have these nice thick roots that are really easy to untangle and a little bit harder to dry out and kill. And I love how compact their growth is in, in terms of the stem. And they're definitely climbing um, anthuriums that could benefit from a moss pole, but they generally don't need moss poles and they're not gonna reach for something to climb. Sometimes they can get a little bit unruly, but overall it's much easier to maintain their growth pattern, which just makes it so much more enjoyable for me to grow. So that probably feeds into like why I spend the most time and energy into caring my, for my anthuriums. And just something about them sparks so much more joy in me than any other genus especially within the Raceae family. So um, I'm very excited to do an all anthuriums video for you. I thought it would be best to kind of just do mainly a favorites because showing my entire anthurium collection will be like probably a three hour video. I just don't have the energy for that. But maybe one day, it's definitely not out of the question, but right now, don't have the time to show you every anthurium. I also asked you guys for anthurium related questions on Instagram. I got quite a few responses, but luckily a lot of them are repeats, like more or less the same kind of question. So I think I'm gonna get through a lot of them today. So what I thought I would do is like show you my favorites or like the ones that are like very special to me. And then while doing that, answer some questions as I go. And then any questions that aren't super relevant to the plants I'm gonna show you, I will answer at the end. So I'm using the term favorites very loosely because I could probably convince myself like every one of my anthuriums is a favorite for one reason or the other. So I'm just gonna kind of casually lump in a bunch of plants that I just feel like talking about today. But if it's like an all time favorite, you guys are gonna know. You probably already know what I'm gonna be talking about. So kicking off the favorites, this plant, I'm holding it right now, is my most favorite. I can pretty much safely say this is my favorite anthurium in my entire collection. You probably already know what it is. I can't even go like two videos without talking about it. If you want to pause the video here and just write in the comments what your guess is, um, I'm pretty sure 99% of you will get it right. My Anthurium Dark Phoenix. This plant is perfect. I know it's a kind of like a hot plant right now, but if you can get your hands on this, it is just such a rewarding plant to grow. It's so easy going in so many ways. It just wants to grow. And I'm gonna tell you exactly what I've been doing to make it grow. I imported this actually with Jing. Um, we did a little like group order, just me and her. This seller claimed that his plant came from like the original grower hybridizer from like the 90s. He wasn't really like a big seller. So I don't know, this is like, this is just what he said. I kind of just took his word for it because he wasn't pushing sales a lot. He was just kind of like chatting. And at the time he called this a Papillolamnum dressleri hybrid. And since then, the Dark Phoenix was given its name, I think from Best Buds Plants on Instagram. It was just kind of like a nickname they gave this plant. <laughs> it's so funny, at, on Facebook, those like snobby elite people were making fun of the Dark Phoenix name a lot. And I remember one guy in particular, he was like, that's like a made up name, it's so stupid, stop calling it Dark Phoenix. And then now he's calling it Dark Phoenix because that name really stuck. So we imported this together. It was a tiny little plant and it didn't really grow for me for a really long time. I actually almost killed it that summer because I went away for three weeks. My boyfriend was taking care of my plants that summer and we had 
what was called a heat dome here in BC where the the temperatures like it was nothing we'd ever seen before in in this generation at least nobody could do anything um, except for just like stay still and try to survive the heat so that happened and a lot of plants died back to chunks actually while I was gone I'm sorry this is just like such a long story but while I was gone a lot of plants died back but he didn't let any of my plants fully die which was like quite a feat considering the conditions and he was he was having to water my plants every day otherwise they were just like drying up completely so at the time my dark phoenix was in moss it was like a moss cocoa chunks mixture and at that time I was acclimating imports in moss. I don't do that anymore. I hate moss. After that summer, it was kind of recovering, but it was growing really slowly. So the thing that turned everything around for the dark phoenix is getting it into pond. I was kind of putting it off for like, I don't know, laziness reasons, but Jing's plant was doing so well in pond and I knew I just needed to do it. And when I did it, it just kind of started exploding. It would not stop growing and it hasn't stopped growing since. And it's gone from like, this big of a leaf to like this big of a leaf. I recently chopped it in a video maybe like a month and a half ago. I chopped off three pieces. One has been sold, one is for Lauren and one is kind of like just sitting there waiting for it to pop. It may never pop, but it started to recover from the chop so fast. All these roots are post chop and it's almost like ready for an upsize. It's crazy. And then it pushed out this leaf very soon after. I took off so much of the roots, so I was really expecting it to, to give me quite a small leaf or like a very more juvenile leaf without like the lobes, but it did not disappoint. Like this is the, this is the leaf prior to it. So it is a little bit bigger, but it's not that much different. And it's still expanding a little bit. You can see like that color is still quite light. It's always lived in my tent that has probably 80 to 90% humidity and it's actually quite warm. So I'm a little bit surprised that a lot of my anthuriums do quite well in there. In the summertime, it probably goes up to like closer to 30 degrees Celsius. I don't know what that means in Fahrenheit, like 4,000. You can do the conversion if you're curious, but it gets quite warm in, in the summertime with all the lights on and it's, it's, a, it's a greenhouse. But my anthuriums surprisingly grow quite well. And I mention that because a lot of anthuriums do well with temperature drops, especially at night. So maybe if my tent was like cooler and I had it in my basement, for example, my anthuriums would be even bigger. I don't know. But they definitely do better in the tent versus like out on my shelf here. I think it's mainly like this, the very consistent humidity in there. So this plant, because it's kind of like high in demand, it's not cheap, but it's not like crazy expensive either. I do highly, highly recommend it. But if you do get it, I can tell you that it, it must be grown in pond. That's a hill I'm willing to die on. It just needs to be in pond. It's just the best substrate for this particular anthurium. I remember, I think it was last year, I repotted Charmaine's Dark Phoenix from soil into pond and I was like, why are you growing it in soil? Because I think she had once upon a time had it in pond that moved it to soil. And while it was in soil, it only put out one leaf and that leaf shriveled off and died before it could fully form. And then since going into pond, I believe it's doing much better so um, i'm going to insist that pond is the best substrate for dark phoenix if i try to like distill my love for this plant into like reasons i think it comes down to a few things so it's velvety which i love it's very dark like like look at the fully hardened leaf and how almost black it is it also has a feature i love in anthuriums which is like very very minimal veining so many plants that are on my wish list have that feature like anthurium dressleri and the pillowiness of the leaf where it kind of puffs out from the veins and the main thing i think is the freaking bunny lobes these lobes are what get me every single time i cannot tell you how much i love this plant so the newest leaf does have like nice little bunny lobes i got a little bit scared because if i pull you up to the camera there are little speckles over the plant and I did do a Safer's End All treatment. I'm not convinced that it's spider mites because I haven't seen um, actual spider mites in the tent. I haven't seen the webbing. I haven't seen the little mites, but I think that 
these little speckles you can see them especially like right here i think they are mites they might not be spider mites but i think it is some type of mite so any sort of miticide should do the trick so i did um i did do a wipe down and luckily it didn't burn underneath the grow lights so yeah while i'm holding this plant let me let me just knock out a few of these questions oh, okay so one was if you could only keep one anthurium what would it be dark phoenix which anthurium do you think everyone should have i mean there's there's multiple but the dark phoenix <laughs> Fastest growing, that's an interesting question because, um, well, assuming that it's happy and it's getting what it needs and it's well rooted and, and all that, anthuriums aren't like the fastest growers. I can't think of any anthurium, at least in my care, that grows like a weed, but this is a very consistent grower for me. The time in between leaves is quite short, like it's always kind of pushing something. So this is definitely a contender for fastest growing, I think. Oh yes, hybridizing. So there were a few questions that were asking like, what I plan on hybridizing, am I pollinating my anthuriums? So to answer the second question, I do have a hybrid going right now that's like just behind me. I might show you a bit later. It's not this one, but in my plans for hybridizing my, my plants, the Dark Phoenix is my number one priority. So the really exciting thing is that Jing's Dark Phoenix is just starting to flower. So she's gonna collect the pollen from that. And I said, <laughs> I'm willing to bet money on it, uh, what little money I have, that by the end of the summer, my Dark Phoenix is gonna be flowering as well. And we're going to make Dark Phoenix babies. I just want more Dark Phoenix. Like I don't care what it takes. I just need to make it happen. So that's definitely the first priority on my wish list. If for some reason she ends up using the pollen like on something else, like maybe her dark phoenix like flowers again, then um, I would probably just collect my own pollen and then wait for it to flower again. Another cross I think would be really cool is dark phoenix and forgettii, because on the off chance that it would produce a baby that looks like this, but with a few sinus, like how cool would that look? I just think forgettii with the peltate leaves, meaning like the sinus is fused, there is no sinus. I think it's such a awesome feature. And I think it's pretty dominant too, because um, any sort of forgetty eye cross can at least sometimes produce a leaf with a fused sinus. So that's a plant I want to hybridize maybe with Dark Phoenix, um, with Luxurians. I've seen forgetty eye Lux hybrids and a lot of them do have a sinus, but every now and then a picture will pop up on Instagram or Facebook where it's like a Luxurians with a completely few sinus and it's just, oh, so beautiful. But yeah, to answer that question, Dark Phoenix, Dark Phoenix self is my first priority. End of story. Pretty sure I've been talking about the Dark Phoenix for like half an hour. Let's move on, shall we? Next one I'm gonna show is not the most stunning, beautiful, large specimen, but I already know it's going to be an all-time favorite in my, in my collection. This plant is from Amanda. I think a lot of the plants I'm gonna show you today are gonna be from Amanda, who is Bunny on Instagram. I will link her Instagram in the description. She is my ultimate plant fairy. This is my Anthurium Ace of Spades dark form. This was like a birthday gift kind of thing um, last year. I'm just stunned that this plant is in my collection still. So it's currently pushing a leaf. I was going to repot it. It's currently potted in um, tree fern, like perlite mix, and it's pretty rooty in there. And I definitely need to upsize the pot before I go away on my trip. But right now it's doing fine. So I think I might have time to let this leaf grow out a little bit before I disrupt it. So it's only been like a few weeks since this fully hardened and like already the next one has popped out. So it's kind of speeding up now. I've been able to keep it quite dark and I would say it's probably getting quite high light. Um, I think probably more light than it wants. So you can see that this leaf is like facing down a little bit and this would be a leaf that's like facing a light. It's looking a little bit greener in the viewfinder than it is in person. Like in person, it looks a lot more dark and sultry and just, mm. but this also embodies a lot of the characteristics I love, which is a very minimal veining. Obviously it's very dark and I really love the Ace of Spades shape where the lobes, they're quite round 
and then they kind of curve inwards with this little like keyhole sinus that's like very typical ace and it's just so beautiful one thing i feel like um is very important information to know for those of you who are like collecting anthuriums and buying a lot of crosses like that are seeds or seedlings and i only learned this like fairly recently from lauren um the ace of spades when selfed will not produce this plant for the most part like the traits that um, make up this plant i think are quite recessive so if i were to self this plant and produce a batch of seeds a lot of those plants will not grow up to look like this it will have like more more prominent venation it just doesn't look the same i've seen one i think it was on Facebook or Etsy and I was like that can't be an ace I was like that's definitely not an ace like what a liar but it turns out that it was a self ace but it doesn't end up actually looking like this so if you're buying an ace of spades that is a self of the dark form you might not actually get the dark form I think maybe it's a little bit deceptive to say like ace of spades dark form or like tezula dark form self because not every buyer is going to know that a self plant will not look like this like the dark phoenix on the other hand if I were to sell this the chances of it producing a, a plant that looks very much like it is a lot higher so I feel like that's like important information to know and then while we're at it I might as well show you my other ace this is my green form ace of spades I don't know if I've ever shown them side by side before but this one is from Lauren this one's from Amanda and I don't recall where her plant originally came from may have been NSE tropicals I think she got a lot of her like OG plants from NSE but this is from tropicals Equiflora it's funny they call it the green horn because it obviously has the ability to be like at least just as dark as the dark form it just has more prominent venation but they both share one trait which is let me put this down the very red sinus you can see it also on this leaf but the shape doesn't look quite the same it doesn't have that like rounded lobe with the curved in you know that shape i was talking about i'm not 100% sure on the history of this plant and why it's called Ace of Spades even though it looks quite different from like what most people call the Ace of Spades. I'm trying to remember the story so I think there was a hurricane in Florida and it kind of wiped out um, someone's garden. I think maybe after the hurricane there was a batch of seeds that was salvage and then passed on to Dennis Rotolante which is um, the father of William Rotolante the owner of Silver Chrome Gardens one seed I think one plant from that seed batch ended up being this guy the dark form Ace of Spades that we know and love and the lineage of this plant is basically it's a mystery whether this came from that seed batch I don't actually know and like feel free to fact check that story I just told I just I know there were those kind of people involved and and I remember reading Bill Rogelante's like version of the story in a Facebook comment and I have it screenshotted somewhere I just I can't I can't find it in my phone but that's how I remember the story but yeah these two will always be a love a love love of mine if I were to pick one I would probably pick this one just yeah I mean I don't think I need to explain myself but this one is also a favorite I love this plant I was so happy when Lauren um, allowed me to buy it okay so this next plant is I think going to be well not I think as long as I have plants I'm going to be growing this anthurium because it's probably an all-time favorite plant I don't talk about it that much on this channel and the reason for that is that up until very recently it wasn't growing very well for me I've had it for like more than two years probably coming up to three years and in that time it should have grown a lot bigger than it actually is you'll see in a second but it was probably taking like six months in between leaves and it wasn't until I recently changed the substrate that it started to grow a lot better it started rooting better I just think it's able to take up a lot more nutrients this way so that is my Anthurium VCI narrow form. So here's where I wanna tell you about like my favorite substrates for Anthuriums. This one, for almost as long as I've had it, was in like a soil mix, but it was like full of chunks. 
I want to say that mix was when I was using soilless soil, meaning that like the the bulk of the mixture was like cocoa coir, and then I would have like big chunks of bark, perlite, coconut chunks, worm castings, charcoal, all that stuff, and it was like very loose and super airy and chunky. It was growing leaves, but every leaf was pretty much exactly the same size, like just not very just not very satisfying so I just it didn't give me much joy in that time and I think it was about just before Christmas of last year so like six or so months ago I repotted it on camera and I got it out of that mix into tree fern fiber soil so about 50 50 tree fern fiber and my soil mix like my aer aeroid mix I'm using the pro mix high porosity myco soil. I'm working through like a gigantic bag of that. I'm not sure if I super love it, but I don't dislike it either. I mix in more perlite, um, bark, and that's pretty much like the majority of the mix. And if I have worm castings, I'll add that in. If I have, did I already say bark? I did say bark. I bark I always add in. If I have like leftover bits of LECA, I always throw that in. It's kind of like a dumping ground for substrates. So I added half of that half tree fern and the response on this plant was almost immediate so it started to root like this within a week and I was so stunned because I'd never seen such like um, satisfying roots from this plant before and then it started pushing a leaf right away um, I think the first leaf that I put out after that was this one so it's pro I think the biggest leaf that I've grown in my care maybe maybe this leaf would have been similar size but it was definitely an upsize from the leaf prior which would have been this one so for that one to this one very nice and ribby and then it's just popped this one which is going to be a magnificent one as well judging by how big the leaf is and the leaf hasn't even fully unfurled yet still in that curly taco phase it's going to be bigger than this leaf I will say I'm not a huge fan of the regular VGI that's like not not the narrow form which has more space in between these ribs. There's something about this like super ribby one that really does something to me. The regular VGI I can appreciate it but I don't really have any desire to own one. And just in case there's anyone who doesn't know this yet, narrow form refers to not the narrowness of the leaf but like the narrowness of the space in between the ribs. So a regular VCI is going to have like more wide, wide ribs and then the narrow is like much more, much more numerous in the <laughs> number of ribs. Every now and then you can get like a narrow, narrow, but narrow really only refers to this. So in theory you could have a very wide narrow form VCI. Um, sometimes people will sell VCI narrow form, that's not actually narrow form, but it's showing narrow elongated leaves, but it's not narrow in the ribs, so it's not like a true narrow form. Yeah, so while we're here talking about substrates, I will tell you, because this was a question that came up many times, like what my favorite substrates are from Anthuriums, and there are th three slash four. My favorite substrate I think is going to be Pawn. And by pawn, I mean the mix that I make with like the extra amendments. So that's lechuza pawn, coarse perlite, and orchiata. It's done such good things for a lot of my anthuriums. My second one is tree fern fiber. That's the substrate that I'm newest to. I have the least experience with. But tree fern has been so great for, for rooting plants. I just haven't had plants growing in there long term. So I can't really tell you like if there's a, a point where you could get it into something more nutritious. So I guess stay tuned for that in like the next year or so. Um, the third is this tree fern fiber soil. I have a few anthuriums in this mix and they all freaking love it. They root really well and they start to grow faster. And I guess the fourth like honorable mention would just be my aeroid mix soil. I don't know that like I have a lot of anthuriums growing in that that I feel like are just growing out of control and it's purely because of the substrate. I, I think anthuriums do fine in soil for me, but this tree fern fiber soil actually produced like much more impressive results. Just that's just my experience. So the next two I'm going to show you um, is going to answer a couple of questions that came up quite a bit, which is all around strap leaf pendant anthuriums. Like what my favorite is, what's the easiest, I guess basically that. 
So we're gonna talk about those two and then we're gonna take a break because my stomach is rumbling. I'm not even hungry, but as soon as I turn on the camera, my stomach starts to rumble. Okay, so the first one I'm gonna show you is my Anthurium Politiflorum. I've had it probably for like three and a bit years. It's grown quite a bit, and as you can see, it's dropping some leaf <laughs> right now, um, which also coincidentally is going to answer another question that came up a few times. So this is my main one. This is the one I've had the longest. I used to grow this in a slitted like orchid pot in a mixture of moss and bark, and maybe there was cocoa chunks in there, and it did fine in it, but um, I find this to be quite a thirsty anthurium, so um, that mix was not, it was just not retaining moisture and it would just dry out a lot. So I got it out of that and I got it into no drainage. So this is tree fern fiber with like perlite and pond stuff mixed in with a Leca reservoir layer at the bottom, which obviously it has rooted into. I mean, the roots are very, very full in here. Um, but what's happening lately, I've seen other people have this issue too, is that it's growing a leaf and dropping a leaf. Um, I don't know why. So currently this one's obviously on its way out, but this one is starting to go. So I guess like all I can really say about that issue is that when a plant drops a leaf every time it grows a leaf, it doesn't have enough energy in the plant or like not a big enough root system or not enough nutrition to sustain all those leaves so it will pull back nutrients from oldest leaves and like kind of direct that towards the top growth so if it's like the lowest leaf that's dropping off like it's not really a cause for alarm but i guess it can be a little bit worrying when it's like constantly dropping leaves or the leaves are getting fewer and fewer and fewer i, I totally get that I'm not super worried. Maybe it's a sign that I need to kind of up the up the nutrients on the plant because you can see that like it's not really the root system, right? Like if it was, if it had suddenly lost tons of root to rot, then I can see why. And it can also be like inconsistent watering, underwatering. It just doesn't have enough water nutrients to sustain growth, so it kind of like sacrifices older leaves in order to make energy for new ones. I, I don't think I underwater this, but I think recently I did underwater it once because I walked into this room and the leaves were like, the leaves were all like all curled in. So a lot of people were asking like, what's the best strap leaf anthurium, pendant anthurium, what's the easiest one, what's, what's a good anthurium for ambient conditions, best anthurium for a beginner, and this is quite a good contender for all of those questions. I find the politiform so easy. <laughs> and they're very easy to acclimate post-import. They root so fast and they just kind of get going right away and they grow quite steadily as well. This is one of the anthuriums that's always pushing growth. It doesn't have like a long dormancy period in between leaves. Other than like the lower leaves going, I don't really know why. Um, it's quite an easy anthurium. It's currently pushing a leaf right there. And the last leaf was not as big as the one prior. So this is like, the biggest leaf that's ever grown in my care and the last leaf is really pretty but not quite as big but still nice and strappy like it's probably around the length of my arm it's a little bit narrower very dark and just just beautiful so this is a really good one for beginners or new to anthuriums this is a really good one to start with because it doesn't really need high humidity i probably would give it high humidity when like first importing it if you're going the import route but it doesn't need to live in high humidity and it's gonna be really hard to keep this in high humidity unless you have a humongous tent because it grows like, like look at how much height. Oh, you're not even gonna be able to see the whole plant. If I pull it back here, like the amount of vertical space you need to house this plant is, is a little bit insane eventually. But if you can keep it in a greenhouse, at least while it's smaller, it will grow faster. That's my experience with it. But the likelihood is you're gonna have to like acclimate it down to household conditions eventually. And I think it's just really tolerant of a lot of things. One thing I will say is, um, <laughs> so these sheets that it comes out of, these are deciduous sheets. So they, they, they just brown off all right away and they have these like very papery, kind of wispy looking things. I recommend leaving them on <laughs> because Charmaine went and pulled off all my sheets of my plant because she loves to do that. And what you end up with 
is a stack of dicks and it's very disturbing to look at. So I much prefer the sheets on for the Politiforum. That's just a little tip because you don't really know there's a dick stack under there until you take the sheets off and then it's, it's kind of upsetting. So this is my main plant or my oldest plant. And then earlier this year, I imported another one. So this is a very narrow one, which has been the case for a lot of the Politiforums that Equiflora is pushing out with Tropicals plants. The last couple of imports have been full of these like very narrow Politiforums and just, they're just so nice. And I think a lot of people are looking for them now that they're showing up in a lot of people's collections. I think it was like February when we got this import. This one I actually didn't order. I went to the pop-up and I saw this and I had to have it. Obviously, I didn't know that the politiforms were coming in narrow. They're not marked as narrow. So I wasn't like, you know, going to order a second one because I was very happy with my other one. So as expected, it rooted really well. It was acclimated inside of a bin, which I don't think it absolutely needed it, but it didn't hurt either. And then it got moved out into like my tall EXO on the left here, this one right here. And it gets very high light, um, probably like a few hundred foot candles. And it just is doing really well. It's pushed out one leaf in my care, this one here, which has persisted as narrow, which is really nice. And then it's actively pushing another one right now. So that would be the second leaf in my care. I'm really actually excited for this to grow really big because if you imagine like very narrow, but super long, like sword like leaves, I kind of recommend no drainage for Politiflorum, just because, like I said, it's quite a thirsty one. So being able to water it through is kind of a little bit on the difficult side if it has drainage holes. I mean, I guess like water it through and let the... And Sorry, I just noticed my fright. I put out an all white leaf. Dang it. What was I saying? Um, oh yeah. So no drainage is a little bit more water retentive than drainage, obviously, because you can keep a little bit of a reservoir in there, but you do have to, again, acclimate a plant to no drainage. So a root system that is used to drying out in between waterings, it will likely throw a fit when transferred to no drainage if you don't let it dry out in between. If you keep it consistently wet, after it had become used to like a wet dry cycle, then it can, it can cause rot. Like that's happened to me before. Um, my stomach is rumbling. If you guys caught any of that, I am so sorry. I'm going to take a quick break now um, and eat something, so I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. I had a bowl of cereal, feeling much better. Probably ruined my lipstick, but that's okay. So we're talking about strap leaf anthuriums. The second one that is like my favorite in my whole entire collection. You guys probably already know which one it is. My Anthurium Wenlingurai, which is a plant that is getting more and more obtainable by the minute. Um, this one I've had for about two and a half years or so. I grew it from like a little plant, maybe about this size. This is one of the leaves. Maybe it was in, yeah, I think I grew this one. So it was like slightly smaller than this when I got it. I think Politiflorum is a strap leaf pendant anthurium that is like very beautiful. It has like almost velvety texture, very like glittery and almost a little bit holographic-y. But the Wenlingeri has the best like physical texture. Like it's so nice, it's so leathery and um, it's quite dark, I think it's arguably darker than the Vitarifolium. I will actually say that I don't find the Vitarifolium as easy as people say. I think the Politiform is actually easier in terms of being able to grow fully formed leaves. Vitarifolium I find a little bit more difficult, although both are fine in ambient conditions. I just think the Politiform responds a little bit better. It's a little bit easier growing. The Wenlingeri, I've never tried to grow in ambient conditions. I've only ever grown it either in my Millsbow cabinet or in my tent. I'm sure it can be done. I know, Anth um, I'm <laughs> I was gonna call her Anthurium. I know Amanda grows her Windlingeri in ambient conditions just by her window. And it's kind of like hanging from the ceiling and it's just like an absolute beast. It's freaking huge. Like I think some of the leaves are as long as some people are tall, like a pretty short person, but hers is absolutely stunning. Um, they are different, my Windlingeri and hers. Hers is originally came from Jay Vanini. Mine came from some unknown location in Singapore where they originally got it, I don't know, but it morphologically looks different. Hers definitely has more of like a ripply kind of 
look and the texture is a little bit different because um, she did send a cutting to Charmaine and I got to see in person obviously and the texture is I feel like not quite as thick as this one and it's a little bit less glossy mine's a little bit more on the glossy side very very waxy I just find the Windling Grey so much prettier than Vitarfolium. So some people find it really difficult to tell a difference and I totally get that. With Vitarfolium, you'll notice that like where where the leaf blade starts to form, it's like it tapers, so it starts really narrow and then it kind of comes out. So it's like a sharp shape. With the when Lingerai, it is quite rounded. Oh my gosh, I almost dropped him. It's much easier to see on like a young leaf. So it's almost like, you know, a teardrop shape, you know, if I turn it upside down. That's definitely a feature I look for in young plants if you're trying to identify whether something's actually a Wenlingeri. But that said, within Wenlingeri, there is a lot of variability. The NSE Tropicals Wenlingeri is so beautiful. It's so dimply and textured, but I, I, I love the texture on this. It's so thick. I wonder if you can kind of like see just how thick it is. It's so satisfying to touch. So this plant was very similar to the Vichai in that it wouldn't grow. It would take many, many, many months in between in between leaves and it would just kind of like, felt like it was stuck in time. It wasn't declining, it just wasn't really growing. And it was also in a very similar, like super barky mix. I would probably assume it's the same mix that my Vichai was in. It was also in a slitted pot, like a five inch slitted orchid pot. I think it was also around the same time, maybe, actually the same video that I repotted the Vichii. I took a bottom cutting of this that has, uh, I assume, is still alive and it's ooh, I gifted that to Charmaine. And then I potted it into tree fern and I'm pretty sure this is pure tree fern. Well, tree fern with perlite, like I mean no soil. I'm pretty sure if I'm remembering correctly because this just looks like tree fern. I could be wrong, but anyway, the roots went crazy like it loved it so much and it was rooting so fast and it started pushing growth and i think in that time it's grown two or three leaves which is way more leaves than i ever got it to grow in such a short period of time it's actually like pushing up right against the pot which i mean i think i'm gonna have to like guide the stem out so it can actually go over the lip of the pot it did try to flower for me um i think it was like a month ago and the inflow just aborted and died which is a question that a lot of you had, so I'll get to that in a second. But the spadex never even fully emerged out of the spades, which was what I was most excited for to see if it would corkscrew, but it didn't. So we'll see with the next one, but like it's it's really good to know that this is at a flowering age now. I don't know if I have any plans to cross it with anything. Maybe I would try to self it at some point, or maybe it would be really cool to cross it with like Charmaine's Windling Grey or something, if um, she can get it to flower as well. Also, Jing has a Windling Grey, which is from maybe Singapore as well, but it looks a little bit different to mine. So the inflow thing, a lot of people had questions on, um, they have issues with their inflow always like dying off. And I assume they mean like, as soon as it emerges before it's able to emerge out of the space and go through a receptive stage and a pollen bearing stage. So um, I haven't had that issue so much, but I've had in the past issues of leaves coming out and just like shriveling off. So I'm assuming that's kind of very much a similar issue. Let me put them down for a second. What I understood from, from that and how I was able to remedy that is that it's a very much a nutritional slash um, healthy root system issue. So I had this one plant and that plant um, now lives with Charmaine. It was sold to me as a Magnificum, but it wasn't a Magnificum. It was maybe like a, it was maybe like a Pappy Warrock Magnificum hybrid. It was like very elongated. And that one, like every leaf it pushed, it would shrivel off. It probably did that like five times until I discovered Myco and I introduced Myco to the soil and then it stopped doing it. It just started growing leaves, fully foreign leaves again. Prior to Myco, I tried to remedy it by using um, fertilizers because at that time I was using, I think, liquid dirt, which I've already said before, but I find that liquid dirt sucks and it doesn't do anything. So I asked advice from a friend of mine who had much more experience with anthuriums and she said, um, 
you know, those like organic fertilizers don't really have much um, to offer for nutrition. So get something stronger. She recommended a few things. She also recommended CalMag. So I did try that fertilizer route first, didn't really help. And then myco was the thing that kind of turned things around for that plant. So if you're having issues with um, inflows or leaves never fully forming and dying off, like it's just emerged and then it just kind of like, it just dries up and like goes away, even though the root system looks good, then I would suggest that it's probably a nutrition thing. So this is probably too complicated of a topic to get into in this video, but you can be fertilizing your plants a lot without the plant even taking up the nutrition because your pH is off. So a lot of people would have heard that the ideal pH range for aeroids is 5.5 to 6.5 ish around there, just like slightly acidic. And that's because at that pH, um, nutrients are a little bit more readily available to the plant. Um, they're a little bit more soluble in water. So at a higher pH, a more basic pH above seven is going to be um, less nutritious to the plant because those nutrients are not going to be water soluble or less water soluble. So your plant going, can be starving for nutrition even though you are fertilizing the substrate. So one thing you can do is test the pH, um, not just of your nutrient solution, but also of your substrate. So the way you can do that, and I will link a video, <laughs> it's a very old video of me testing pH of my, my substrates, like it was pond and soil against just, I think I just did water and also my nutrient solution, which is like a slightly different nutrients that I currently use, but um, it doesn't really matter. Just I'm just to show you the process. So to test what the plant is actually gonna be getting, because sometimes the substrate can change the pH of the general solution as well. Pour your nutrient solution into the substrate and like if you have drainage holes, let it run out and then test that runoff water. And if the pH is, is between 5.5 and 6.5, then great. That's at a pH range that your plant can actually take up the nutrients. If it's outside of that, that can cause problems. So very acidic substrates can can cause fertilizer burn because those nutrients are way too soluble and above that can cause what they call nutrient lockout so it's just like not available to your plant. So I think that's definitely something that everyone should, I mean if they're having issues they should be testing that and just to get an idea of what your plants are actually getting. So you don't want to be wasting money on fertilizers when your plant's not even going to be utilizing it. Personally for me, the water in Vancouver is quite basic. It's somewhere around 8.3-ish. So luckily a lot of the fertilizers I use um, does lower the pH. So in the end I didn't actually have to use pH down to bring it to a good level. And because I pretty much water with every single watering, then it's totally fine. Another thing that, oh, I just have a little light thing on my face. Another thing that drops pH I found is um, filtration. When I used to water with Rita filter water, that would bring my pH down about a full point and then the fertilizer would bring it down even more. I think of Micro as kind of just like this this safety net, this like support system that fixes a lot of problems that we don't even know are there. So if you're not already using Myco, like I just think it's such a great thing to use. It makes plants so much more hardy. I find it makes plants more drought tolerant. I have issues with underwatering my plants. Oh my gosh, this light, uh, I'm gonna go over here. I have issues underwatering my plants and since using Myco, I haven't had so much issue with like drought stress. I found so many plants, anthuriums included, that were like so dry, but it didn't it didn't um, show any signs of it. So I didn't even realize that it was thirsty until like I lifted the pot and it was just like light as air. So that's definitely one benefit. And the other thing is that it, you can kind of just trust that the mycos doing good things in your in your in your substrate. I talk about Great White all the time. I'm not at all affiliated with Great White. I would love to be affiliated with Great White, but I'm not. It was a total game changer in the hobby for me. I was able to size up plants that I never was able to size up in the past, even to the point where I had to chop the plants back down because I couldn't deal with the size anymore. TPS Billions is one that Charmaine uses, 
and I do have and I've used it but I don't reach for it as much as Great White so I can't really speak to like how much I love it but I know it's definitely one of the good ones. I will say that not all Myco companies are created equal. Sometimes they don't have the strains that they claim to have or they're not they're not a good quality so they're not actually going to germinate in the substrate so Great White I can say just based on the reaction from the plants it really does work. Another thing that can cause emergent leaves to, to shrivel off before it's able to form is um, like root issues. So if you're, let's say, I don't know, you imported a plant and it lost a lot of the roots, but it was like pushing out a leaf while it was in transit, that leaf might not make it and that's kind of normal. Because like imagine um, it formed this leaf with this big root system and then in the time that it was pushing out that leaf, like all the roots died then it's not going to be able to sustain that new growth and it might abort that growth and another thing is like root rot dry rot just root death in general can cause the leaf to shrivel off before it can really form but if your roots look good and you're having that issue then i would either check the ph and or add myco but if you're already doing all of those things and your leaves and slash inflows are still aborting then i would maybe give it a few um tries before i get concerned because um the when linger i for example it aborted that inflow but it was the first inflow it ever put out so the first flower they recommend not pollinating because it's too young to really bear the fruit because I've done that once with the Forgetii and like it didn't die but it also like got really stunted after that for a really long time like over a year. Some species have a tendency to just die back like just drop all their leaves if either you pollinate too many inflows or you pollinate them too young. So I've heard that um, luxurians can throw a huge fit if you pollinate it. So I think that's why a lot of people use luxurians as the pollen donor and not the um, seed parent. So if it's your first inflow that's dying off, I probably wouldn't read too much into it. I'll wait for the next one. Eventually, when the anthurium gets to a certain maturity level, and of course this will kind of depend on the species, but for the majority of the anthuriums that are like popular in the hobby, once it gets to a certain age, it would be putting out inflows quite consistently. And some species are just like prolific flowers like Forgetii. Oh my gosh, so many flowers. Mine put out like two to three at the same time. It's ridiculous. But it's nice because I, I really enjoy the Forgetii flower smell. Um, so hopefully that answered some questions on leaves slash inflows dying off. Okay, I think I just have a few more to get through and then we're gonna rapid fire the remaining questions. I feel like there's a glass vessel by the window. <laughs> This looks funny. Okay, um, next one before I get more distracted. This is a very sad one, but I'm gonna show you it because this is one of my all-time favorite anthuriums. I imported this, I think, late 2020 or early 2021. This is my anthurium king of spades. This was a very exciting leaf for me. This grew like in the fall of last year. It's been a little while since I put out a new leaf. Also in that time, I chopped the bottom off with the intention of growing it out and then milling it to Amanda because she doesn't own this plant. We had sent her a cutting of Charmaine's plant and that died. But the crappy thing is my cutting that I made for her also died. It, it kind of led me to believe that this plant doesn't really like being cut or the propagation failure rate's kind of high. The only successful propagation I've ever made was a little offset. So it was already growing a second growth point. It was its own little baby plant and that's doing fine. The, the person I gave it to has sent me an update. So anyway, it took a little while to put out a new leaf. I potted this in tree fern soil, half half, and it rooted out really well and it just recently put out a leaf, but it's covered in mite damage. Uh, the exposure goes a little bit crazy when I go too close to the camera. It is such a beautiful big leaf but it's freaking covered in mite damage and I'm hesitant to call it spider mite damage because it doesn't really look like spider mite damage. I mean, no, no, it does look like spider mite damage, but I don't see spider mites on it, but it could be, definitely could be, but I, I'm just calling it mite damage. It lives in that left exo, which to my knowledge didn't have a spider mite problem, but it also is like right next to a shelf that has spider mites. So I'm not ruling it out. It is a little bit isolated. This was kind of like a little bit hidden. So it was kind of like this in the XO. 
So it was kind of hidden, so I wasn't really seeing the leaf every day. And then when it got to about this size, I looked in there, I was just like horrified. But also looking on the bright side, it did put out quite a large leaf after the chop. Like it is bigger than the last one and it's like so beautiful and veiny. Oh my gosh, I just, I freaking love this plant. When I first imported it, it was a group import with um, Charmaine and Jing. And um, at that time, King of Spades was like not, not a thing. It was called Red Magnificum. I think the sellers hadn't quite landed on a trade name for it. And now it's either called King of Spades or HU, which I'm sorry if I'm butchering his name, but um, Haji Uli is the original hybridizer of this plant. But actually, now that I think about it, this is another plant that I would love to hybridize. Um, very exciting. Lauren has a potential hybrid going with this plant, so I want to see what hers end up looking like. But I think this would be, I mean, one hybrid I know I love is this cross with Red Crystallinum, which Cartel Dawn sells. It's just freaking stunning. So my Red Crystal is very far from flowering age, so it's going to be a really long time before I can cross those two together. But this I think would be really cool with Luxurians because imagine like a Lux hybrid but like freaking fat and round. That would be stunning. I think the silver really never comes out in a in a Lux hybrid. Because I kind of want everything to look like a Forgetti Eye, I think a King of Spades Forgetti Eye hybrid would look awesome as well. Because if you just imagine this leaf, but with a few sinus, I would just die. I would simply, I would simply pass away. So I have treated this with Safer's End All, but um, in the next few weeks, I'm going to do Azimax treatments basically on every plant in this room and give it a couple weeks to see if like spider mites um, come back. My first round of Azimax didn't go so well. It did do good things in that it seemed to be effective in getting rid of spider, spider mites in my tent, but it also caused a ton of burn. So it's just really a matter of like making sure the lights aren't on until the, the Azimax is fully dry. Cause let's just look how beautiful this leaf could have been. Like we really could have had it all, but freaking spider mites. Oh yeah, so I was gonna show you the roots. These are the roots in tree fern soil. I didn't fill this pot up all the way because um, I didn't want to bury the stem so much because it had just been chopped, but at this point I could probably build it up slightly. If you already use tree fern and soil, then like I, I recommend just trying it out on an anthurium, especially if it's already used to growing in soil. I find that transition from soil to tree fern soil is just like seamless and beautiful. Okay, so hopefully in the next time you see this plant, I'll have a better leaf to show you. This is one of the slower growers though. I think most people would agree that it it's like a pretty slow going plant. It just quite, it's quite easy going, but it doesn't grow so fast. I would expect a leaf every like three to four months on this plant. Okay, so I mean, if I could show you all of my Amanda plants, I will, maybe that's a future video. Actually, I think that could be a good then versus now video because I got all these plants as like really tiny babies and I think that would be really good. But I'm gonna show you one, one more? One more. Yeah, one more and then we're gonna kind of start to wrap up the show and tell part. So this is probably my, oh, it's hard to say. It's one of my favorite plants I've ever gotten from Amanda just because it, you're gonna see in a second, it exhibits a lot of my very, very beloved traits and anthuriums. So this is my Anthurium papillolaminum RA5 self. Amanda has a humongous one and she selfed it and produced many, many babies and a lot of people have this plant from her. So I got it as a teeny tiny baby. It was smaller than this leaf. I think the biggest leaf was maybe just like that big. There was two in one pot, so one went to Charmaine, one came to me. They were pretty much the same size and I think that was about 10 months ago, nine months ago. And it's been growing so well, not crazy fast, but it's been fairly easy going in my tent. I haven't had like root issues with this like I've had with other little anthuriums. I'm pretty sure I've had it in pond since day one that it came into my house. So I really love like the texture on this plant. It's actually unreal. Like, look at this, look how bullied it is and like how dark the leaves are. Very, very minimal veins. I really love the overlapping lobes. They're very round on top and then they just like overlap and do this cute little, little, I don't know, 
why do you call that? It's like, um, just looks like a little flower. It's so pretty. It, it does that on every single leaf, including this new one, which is um, a nice-ish, a pretty good size up. So the leaf before would have been this one. And then it did size up and it, you can see it's still a little bit floppy. So it'll expand just a little bit more before it fully hardens. And then this would have been the first leaf since upsizing the pot and i was saying like during the growing season um if you do have a growing season if you are growing in a greenhouse then it's kind of always growing season but upsizing the pot on your anthuriums can lead to a size jump like this is not a significant size jump but but the leaves before it weren't increasing at the same rate until I upsized the pot and it got quite a bit bigger but of all the papillolamnums i find this one is just so special because of just all the things combined, but I think especially because of that texture. And it's so consistent. The leaf, um, the first leaf that really blew me away was this one. When it got to this size and that texture really started to show up, I was just in awe. Like it was, it's just so disgusting and beautiful at the same time. So this has definitely been a huge joy to grow. The only thing I will say about this plant is that the leaves get marked up and dinged up so easily. Like you can see all the little scratches on this leaf and this is just from it bumping into other leaves as it was forming. Like you know how like when anthuriums grow, they kind of do this kind of little dance with the leaves. That's literally it. Like I don't, I don't pick up this plant and like fondle it when it's growing a new leaf, except for like I'm doing it right now because it's already damaged. But I make a point of not touching the leaves on this plant when it's growing one and every leaf without fail has little dings all, all over it. I've never had a plant in my collection this um, sensitive to markings. That's really the only bad thing I have to say about it. But other than that, it's just, it's so beautiful. So I have a lot of forgetty eyes. At one point I had like 25 or something like that. I have less now because I've sold a lot of them, but I've kept a few back that are like my favorite. And this next one I think is my favorite forgetty eye. And it didn't used to be, but it now is. It's so, it's so pretty. I didn't used to love this plant that much. I imported it maybe 2020 around then or late, late, late 2020, early 2021 from Tropicals. I've sold some on, I've traded some. I think I've like let some die. This one I always kept back because when it was young, it was producing and all those leaves are gone. So I can't even show you, but this is the best example I can show you. They were very elongated and narrow. So I thought that was really interesting. So I kept it back just to see if it would grow really elongated like forever. So I wasn't picturing like a large leaf, but really narrow and long with that silver venation and a few sinus. And I thought that would be really cool. Um, it didn't turn out to be the case, but I still really like this plant. So it's very black. I've been able to get this plant more black since getting more light on it. So in the past, it was just getting Barina lights from above. So I would probably guess that it was probably around 300 foot candles, just overhead lighting. But since adding mother lights in front, it started getting blacker. I'm still trying to figure it out for myself. Um, sometimes anthuriums seem to be getting blacker with more light. And then sometimes they'll get lighter more, with more light, which is like what the general consensus is like the less light the more chlorophyll but that's not really the case with this plant so what i really love about it is the shape is so so symmetrical and so round on top and i'm not sure if the viewfinder is going to really pick up this texture but do you see it's kind of like pebbly like leathery pebbly i'm going to contrast this with another forgetty eye that i have that's like very smooth just so you guys can see what i'm talking about okay so this is the other one this was sold as um ace of spades forgetty eye and the seller quickly like retracted that so i don't think this is anything to do with ace of spades this was just like gifted to me from jing so if you look at the texture on this plant it's very smooth it's definitely not flat but it is smooth now compare it to this oh it's really not showing up on camera dang it maybe on this leaf do you see what i'm talking about or maybe it's just something you have to see in person to really be able to see that texture difference. But it's different, I swear. It's very leathery compared to this one. Maybe if I do this, can you see the difference? Oh, oh, yeah, right there. It has a really leathery grain. So anyway, putting down the other one, I really love how that feels and how it looks. It just looks like it has a bit more dimension to it. 
Just recently, I pollinated my crystal mag. If I can remember, I will take some video just to show you what I'm talking about. So I pollinated this crystal mag that looks a lot like Magnificum with pollen from this, this plant. And it's definitely forming berries, so we'll see what that looks like. It's a very big inflow. <laughs> I don't know where I'm gonna grow this, but I think it could be cool. Um, I think I think Forgetty Eyes are making a little bit of a comeback. I think people were not caring about them for a while, and now people think they're cool again, which is really great because Forgetty Eyes are awesome. So while we're here, um, one question that came up um, a few times is like, uh, tips to acclimating anthuriums down in humidity or like, um, people having trouble with anthuriums emerging and ripping themselves, not by like mechanical damage, but just they're, it's too dry and they just rip as they expand. I definitely have a lot of that happening on this open shelf here. And those were all anthuriums that had either moved out of my tent or moved out of an exo. So really my only advice is that you just kind of have to bear with it for a little while. And assuming the leaves don't have trouble coming out of the sheath, they're, like they're not getting stuck and ripping themselves on the way out, then that ripping should go away after like a few leaves. When the plant has had time to get used to the lower humidity. So you can see that that happened on this plant. Um, this was maybe the second leaf that grew out in ambient conditions, but eventually it'll figure itself out. One thing you may be able to do is make sure that you're feeding CalMeg because the calcium definitely promotes stronger, stronger cells. And one thing I'm planning to try, which I haven't yet, so I can't speak on it from a personal point of view, but silica is one thing that can pr promote stronger cell walls. So that might be something that can fix this issue from happening, but I can't say that it for sure does from my experience because I've never used it. Even like the more like tough, like easygoing anthuriums I find can do this when you take it out of higher humidity. It doesn't super bother me, I guess, because I have a lot of anthuriums that can like, I can divert my attention to. So I don't have to look at these like broken anthuriums and be sad, but Calmeg and silica are definitely some things to look into. But I wanted to actually, before we get onto the rest of the questions, just tell you guys like my current anthurium wish list plants. Um, <laughs> one of which I I just obtained, which hasn't come to me yet, but I did purchase it. So I'll tell you that one first. So the anthurium queen of hearts, actually I'll move over here so I can put the photos up. So Amanda sent this plant to us in our last tortilla box, tortilla box, tortilla slap box. I, I lost that plant to Charmaine. She slapped and she won and she picked that one. My consolation prize was the Anthurium Red Beauty, which is not the same, but very similar. They both have Moodyatum in the parentage as far as I know. But anyway, my Red Beauty's freaking dead. And then Charmaine's Queen of Hearts is not dead, but it's um, leafless and rootless. So I ordered one through Lauren and I don't know how long it'll take to get here, but yeah, I have this plant on order and I'm gonna split this one with Charmaine and I'm so excited. Like that was probably the plant that I wanted the most from that box and I haven't really stopped thinking about it since. So when this opportunity kind of presented itself, I had to take it even though I said I wasn't gonna buy any more plants, but I, I just had to. <laughs> I just had to. I've been sitting on the idea of owning this plant since January and I still want it just as badly now as I did back then. So I think I think it's safe to say that I, I really want this in my collection. The only trouble is like, when am I gonna get it? I, I hope I don't get it right before I leave on my holiday, but we'll see. Um, so that is that was on my wish list. I mean, currently is, I don't have it in my possession yet. Another one on my wish list, and I think this one is quite a, hard one to find. I don't know that it's super expensive, but it is kind of elusive. Not a lot of people seem to have it. Um, Anthurium curandero. It looks to me like the perfect blend of Dark Phoenix and Nicrolaunum GG. And those are not the parents whatsoever, but it looks to me like a blend of those two. Texturally, I love the GG. I think it has the best texture around in Anthuriums, like at least as far as like glossy Anthuriums go. And the Dark Phoenix is just like my favorite anthurium of all time. So I really would love to add this to my collection. I don't know how much it costs, so maybe I'm gonna be priced out of this plant, but it is definitely up there. And this one's a little bit of a contentious one, I guess, but uh, anthurium dressleri. And I say it's contentious because there's been a poaching scandal going on recently where um, dressleri was found to have been poached en masse 
and was being distributed. So I guess it's just a reminder to kind of be aware of the seller that you're getting very expensive plants from. Like make sure you're, I guess, doing as much homework as possible on the seller and where their sources might be. I would like to own one, but I've never put this plant on a wish list because it has quite a reputation for being very finicky. Some people have no issues with them and some people like if they breathe on it wrong, then it just dies. So I'm a little bit hesitant, but I do think that this is one of the most stunning anthuriums of all time. It's just so ridiculously sultry and those like blacky veins, the texture, the lobes, the venation, and the emergent leaves on the dresser is just so beautiful, like that dark red and then hardening to black. Oh, so pretty. And then the petioles are just like so frilly and so winged. Um, another one on my wish list is still on my wish list is the Anthurium Bebep Black Velvet Eastern Panama. This plant is getting way more available now compared to like a couple years ago. I remember it used to be like around $1,500 for a little tiny seedling. So it's good to see that the plant is getting more available. I would love to own one that's bred with the Felix, which is um, Justin Jones's Bebep, which is very round and just like, oh, it's so pretty. And he's also hybridized the Felix with Grant's round Bebep, which is, I think, also equally stunning in its own way. A really round one would be really cool. Anyways, I just want one. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. I, I, I would love them all equally, but a pure one. I have a Carla Bevep, which I love. I didn't show it to you in this video because it's looking not so sad, but a little bit sad. It needs to be repotted. And there's definitely more, but the only other one that comes to mind like right now is that wide sinus Bessie Aff that there seems to be only one of in the whole world. And it's so nice. I think because this is such a beautiful um, Bessie AF that it's very high in demand. And um, last I heard it sold for a lot of money, like a cutting of this plant sold for a lot of money. So it's not a plant I ever expect to get, not a clone of that plant for sure. I just have to get super lucky by like seeing one at a pop or something. I'm not gonna waste money by like importing and like ordering a ton of Bessie app and just sorting through and hoping that he sends one. That's like a Dorito shape. I mean, I think by now he probably has wisened to the fact that like that Dorito shape is really high in demand. So he should be like separating them out. Um, so yeah, that's my current Anthurium wish list. So let's go rapid fire through the rest of the questions. Okay, so one question was on like chonk propagations. Um, growing something from like a leafless, rootless chunk. Chunks I find a little bit difficult with anthuriums because so many of them take a really long time to start growing after after being chopped. So it's kind of like to me a set it and forget it kind of thing. So I would either put it in tree fern or perlite. I would say moss because moss does work in a high humidity environment. So maybe moss and then get it into like very high humidity. So if you have like a propagation dome or like a container that you can put it in and just like leave it, give it light and give it like somewhere warmish to reactivate. I find that that activates growth points faster, but also that high humidity can lead to rot. So I would be checking on it. If I see mold, I'm gonna be cleaning it off. As soon as you see mold, it can be a sign that there's stem rot. So if you're able to check on the chunk, like by looking through the, the plastic, then that's ideal. There's a lot of questions on humidity requirements and in general, like, do they all need it? Or like, is this humidity too low for, for anthuriums? And I will say like, Amanda is testament to the fact that anthuriums can, for the most part, um, withstand quite low humidity. You just have to kind of go through the growing pains of like, acclimating them down, assuming they came from a high humidity environment. There are a few anthuriums that absolutely must have high humidity and will never really acclimate down. I mean, never say never, there probably are exception to this rule, but there are a few that you will see damage like within the hour if you take them out of a high humidity enclosure. So there's um, the anthurium splen splendidum. People tend to grow those in cloches, like very high humidity. Um, I have one to show you actually. So this is my Anthurium debile, also known as debilis. So I, I think I got this as like a single leaf plant or maybe it was leafless, I don't remember. Um, I got this from Jing, I don't know why she didn't want it anymore. It was a pretty new import at the time. Uh, the humidity in my tent is not enough for this plant. It grows 
but eventually the leaves all do this. Amanda one time showed me a time lapse of her debilé when she took it out of her tent, I think it was. And I don't know if she was like cleaning her tent or something, but she time lapsed this plant and you could just see it crisping up on the edges. Like, and that was over a span of like 20 minutes. It, this plant needs high humidity. So you don't have that to give it, don't, e don't even bother. It's not gonna be pretty. And it also likes a lot of moisture in the substrate. So I have this planted in tree ferns um, tree fern perlite pond and um, I have it basically like well I tried to have it it's not right now but I have tried to have it sitting in water all the time so I you can see like where the mineral stains are I try to have water to there all the time I've read that they are found growing near water people were watering theirs like every two days and that's how they've been able to get them to grow and stay nice for me I let it sit in water and it's been growing consistently but the leaves never stay pristine for very long like this one this one is still slightly hardening off and it's already getting a little bit crispy probably because it's not as wet and watery as it would like but you can see there's definitely moisture in the substrate it's not dry but it's just not sitting in water so this is definitely one I would recommend only if you can give it those conditions like I would say 90 plus humidity let it sit in water and that's not to say it will stay looking nice but it will actually grow for you i think it is a really beautiful plant though it has a really cool winged petiole as well very much like um luxurians but green like luxurians but not red but yeah humidity wise i think the majority of anthuriums that are kind of passed around this hobby can be um, can be grown in ambient conditions. You just have to, it just you just have to acclimate it down. And there are definitely anthuriums that have a reputation for being like very high humidity, like finicky ones, like the anthurium moraquinum. There are people who grow them like absolutely beautifully in living room conditions, like probably 30, 40% humidity. And sometimes it can be helpful to get a small plant for that reason. And you can kind of get it used to your conditions at a young age. And then by the time it's large, it's already used to lower humidity. Questions about crispy edges. So yeah, here's an example. So this is the other forgetty eye like that was supposedly crossed with ace, which is not. You kind of have to look at where the crisp is occurring. So this is on the leaf tip. This is like leaf tip and edges. And I know for a fact this is from underwatering because this is um, kind of tucked away behind plants in my sh in my tent. So um, I, I when I found it, it was it was like it was like drooping. That's what happened with this one. If you find them in the middle of the leaf, I find that can be a a symptom of like overwatering or inconsistent watering. So one way that can happen is if you let it get really dry and then you just like give it a huge drink, then the plant's gonna be taking up that water too quickly and then um, you'll get edema and that can lead to cells bursting and dying off. So I'll show you one where that has happened. This one is like my most recent import. This is that like silver crystallinum. So when I got it, I put it into water for a little while. Um, of quite a few days actually. Obviously it was not used to growing in water. So we had some cell cells bursting right in the middle. I mean, nothing like, nothing devastating or anything, but that is, I'm almost positive what that is. But it's kind of like the same as if you were to like, be very inconsistent with when you water and then giving way too much water all at once. And theoriums in general, like, like, now that we're talking about watering because there's a lot of watering questions, um, do they like to dry out or do you always want to keep it like at least slightly damp? I personally try at least to not let it completely dry out. So I think the perfect time for me to water is when the reservoir is gone, but there's still moisture in the substrate. And I'm like talking no drainage because the majority of my anthuriums are in pond and no drainage. With soil, maybe you can let it go a little bit longer. With tree fern, I'm still kind of um, figuring it out, but what I've been doing is letting like the, fir the top layer of the tree fern get dry. So from the side, I will see that the, the top layer is like a lighter color, but the bottom is still a little bit on the darker side. That means the the substrate is like approaching dry, but it's not completely dry. I think that's the best you can do for the anthuriums. I find the anthuriums don't respond very well if you let it get completely dry, especially if they're putting out growth. 
a leaf, an inflow. They get so thirsty during that time, they're pulling up so much water and like not watering them on time or not keeping enough moisture or nutrients in the substrate means that that leaf has a high chance of not developing properly. So it might come out like a little bit stunted, a little bit warped. Oh, can I separate a pup or repot a plant when it's growing fruits or should I just not touch it at all? Don't touch it. <laughs> Just don't do it, it's not worth it. It's not impossible that it'll com continue to grow berries, but repotting or cutting is almost a surefire way to ensure that that plant will abort those berries and it will just die. So I don't, I wouldn't recommend it. When to pick berries. If I can find um, a video, I, I had attempted to film a short and then I just never got around to it. Basically when the berries are almost like falling off on their own, that's when they're ready to be picked. I like to harvest them when they're like protruding out and with just like pushing it with my finger, it just pops right off. I think that's the perfect time. A lot of people put these like mesh bags around it, which will catch like falling berries. Oh, I think I answered all the questions that I really was burning to answer. But if I didn't get to your question, feel free to leave in the comments and I'm sure the collective people will help me to answer them because you guys are the best, actually the best. Anyway, thank you for watching. If you stayed all the way to the end, I hope you enjoyed this very anthurium heavy video. I'm totally down to do another one because like I said, anthuriums are my absolute favorite. I have so much time and energy for anthuriums, it's not even funny. So if you want me to do a part two, let me know if there's anything else you like me to add or talk about. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, please remember to give it a like. I love you so much. Have an awesome rest of your day and I'll see you in the next one. Mwah.